right, our next guest, everybody knows and loves, is kind of the girl next door, but really the girl on the island next door. We're gonna be- if an <laughs> island was next door, it would be this her. This would be the girl on the island next door, <laughs> yes. So let's go ahead and give our next guest, uh, Miss Dawn Wells, a call. Hi, is this Dawn? Yes, it is. Hello. Hi. Let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. She is an actress who everybody in America knows and loves as Mary Ann from Gilligan's Island, and she's joining us to talk about her book, What Would Mary Ann Do? A Guide to Life. We are very excited to welcome Dawn Wells to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to me. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. You know, my daughter, who's the other host, just said something I found very interesting, and that is everybody refers to you as the girl next door, but really you're the girl next door on the island. <laughs> That's right, and there, and there was no next door. There were no blocks, anything around the block anyway. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm really kind of surprised after uh, all these years. I know you put out a cookbook, but this is kind of the first time you've kind of written about your life. Well, and it really isn't an autobiography. I've been greeted with fans, you know, with all these... Um, autograph shows around the country and most everybody that comes up to me says I've married a Marianne mm-hmm. or Marianne was my favorite she'd have been your best friend if you were a girl she'd have been your first date if you were a boy and, and they're looking for the values and the um, fairness and the hard work and all the things that Marianne I think really represented and the more I thought about it I thought you know it's so hard today to raise the kids uh, they're all in their rooms with their computers um, both parents are now normally working uh, it's a very different world, and and some of the little things that, not little, some of the things in the book are really pretty basic, generational, you know, about if you start a job, finish it, what kind of manners do you have, not what forks you pick up, uh, uh, what's your dependability, and things like that, and I thought it was a message that Mary Ann should deliver. So how much of Mary Ann would also be advice from Don Wells? Quite a bit, because I was really raised in Mary Ann. And I really laughed because I grew up in Reno, Nevada, where prostitution was legal and <laughs> gambling and divorce. <laughs> what happened? I don't know. But my mother, I mean, I, my parents are divorced. I lived with my mother from the time I was four alone. And my mother and stepmother and father were very good friends. But I never saw my mother date. Uh, she really loved me. She worked. Uh, she, was, she watched me every second. I mean, she knew where I was every single minute. But she, she taught me the values. It just came natural. Yeah. That's the way it was. And and I think that's what's missing. So I really think when I got cast as the character, my description was a girl from Kansas. Right. Mm-hmm. There was a movie star. There was a professor. Uh, there were the wealthy people. I had no description. So I really sort of formed who she was. Of course, that's, I think, where she would be. A good mes- Midwestern girl raised in a farm community. She would have those values. Right. Right. So I incorporated it. And it's very much Darn Wells as well. Now, let me ask you, Don, do you think that, I mean, of course, Gilligan's Island, the show is kind of timeless, but do you think that perhaps the character of Marianne still fits in today's generation? I mean, so much has changed. Oh, yes, I do. I do think it fits. I think what we see are the the Paris Hiltons or the Miley Cyrus or the Kardashians. That's what we see in TMZ and all of that. But I really do think the values are the same. It, it was seven people trying to get along together, and we're all trying to get along together now. Right. Yeah, I do. I, I think that the value is still there, and I think the kids are still there. I think they're a little bit more, less directional. Mm-hmm. I think they're exposed to a lot more things. I think things are much more tempting. But I think parents really are trying to raise them right. You, you know, the, the question comes up because there's always... Everybody says Mary Ann or Ginger. Of course, you know the answer because everybody says Mary Ann. Uh, was there any? Well, time... they wouldn't say Ginger to my face, so what do I know? <laughs> a lot of people would say, especially actors or actresses, that it would be more fun uh, playing the bad girl or more fun playing Ginger. Not that Ginger was necessarily the bad girl. Do you think uh, Tina Louise ever kind of envied you and knowing you were getting all the attention because everybody liked the good girl? 
No, I don't think she envied me at all, because she really was a sex symbol. She was a movie star when she came aboard. I don't think she would want to be a Marianne. I think, uh, I don't know, because I'm sure people come up and say that she was their favorite, too. Yeah. She was absolutely beautiful. I mean, I don't know the reaction from the audience to her. I only know what they say to me, and of course, that's what they're going to say. But I'd have been your best friend. I mean, I'd have been your first prom date. Mm -hmm. I, I went through the Pentagon the week Ben Laden went down, and I had some escorts with me, Marines, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Coast Guard, all taking me through the Pentagon. And about three-quarters of the way through, I don't have any military in my background, so I didn't quite understand the generals have their own coins. And when they shake hands with you, they pass the coins from you to someone else. Right. If they're in a bar, they put it on the bar, and everybody buys them a drink. And when I got out, I don't know, about an hour and a half through the Pentagon, one of the Marines said to me, I've been in the service for 20 years. I only have two. I don't understand it. And I said, you must realize, they're now making decisions whether we bomb Iraq or not. But I was their first crush. <laughs> I, was the, I was the girl that would go on to the prom with them. So they have a feeling about that. You always do. Mm -hmm. You always do. Who was your first love? I don't mean she was their love. But she was approachable. She'd have been your best friend. And I think that sticks with you because I don't think that's there today. Right. Well, I, I think living that lifestyle really is true, that it's good for you and your mind and your health and your body. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, Dawn, and I'm not just saying this, you look absolutely amazing uh, to the point that when I saw your recent movie, Silent But Deadly, I kind of didn't like it. Not because you weren't great. I could not see you in an old folks home at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just trying it out to see how it was going to be. <laughs> Well, I don't feel I am. I mean, I really don't. And it's been a kind of eye-opener for me with these interviews and stuff going on. First of all, I'm single. Second of all, I don't have children. Third of all, I took care of my mother and I took care of my ex-husband. About six years they've been gone now. I've never stopped working. Knock on wood, I'm very healthy. And, and I think it's attitude. I mean, I really think I'm going to live to be 100, or at least I'm going to grow up to be Betty White. I mean, I really do. I mean, you do have health issues, and, and they're hard to overcome. People do. And, but I don't have anybody calling me grandma. Right. And that psychologically is very different. You know, I'm not sitting in a rocking chair teaching, teaching some young kids some, some, something about my life because I don't have them. Right. I'm missing a lot, but I also think of myself, I mean, I really do think of myself as about 50. It's about 50 years old. That's where I am. Well, I'll tell you, Silent But Deadly was, was funny. I must say, uh, Rip Taylor is a good friend of mine, and he did a great job. But I just couldn't see you in that role. Now, maybe I could believe you're on an island with a spider, a big <laughs> giant spider. But <laughs> oh, of course, and there's no stretch there. <laughs> oh, tell Rip Taylor hello for me. I adore him. Oh, uh, no, but no. It, was, it, was a, it was kind of a stretch for me, and I don't know that I did it right. I don't know that, I mean, the movie was very bizarre anyway, yeah. but I, I, I don't know... <clears throat> I don't know that I fit that character. Maybe I was the character that I just created. It certainly was a wasn't a grandmotherly type. Right. You know, so I, I don't know. I you know? was really surprised and pleasantly surprised because I totally could have seen you doing that. That you were in the Miss America pageant? <laughs> in the Dark Ages. Yes, I was. <laughs> wow. I was in college, and they asked me to run for it, and I was a theater major, and I thought, I wonder if I can get up in front of all those people and do a scene, you know. And so I thought I'd enter. Never, never in a million years did I think I would win Miss Nevada. Even I'm little and I'm short and blah blah blah. It was not what I wanted to do uh, as a as a goal. But it was great experience, and um, it's not the same anymore. It's all you know, beautiful girls in bikinis and all of that. We I couldn't even we couldn't even say thank you to the bellman or or talk to any men while we were there. I mean, it was it was really the dark ages, but it was a great experience. Well, I had somebody on that really loves you, and she was on a year or so ago. And that was Bob's wife, Dream of Denver, and she cannot talk to Oh, isn't either. she wonderful? Oh, yes, yes. Bob got lucky. And uh, my, understanding is, my understanding is you still work with her a lot for charity work, right? Oh, I do, and I, and I was uh, visiting a friend of mine in the mountains in Terry Stone Park in Virginia, and she came and we spent three days together. So we really had a good time. Well, she's, a, she's a great lady. I kind of wanted to ask you, and I'm sure everybody that interviews you and speaks with you asks you this, but... In talking about friendships, what was it like on the set and after uh, after the show ended, your friendships with people like Bob and Russell Johnson? Because we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Gilligan's Island. Well, first of all, I just can't believe that of this great cast, and I'm so happy you two ladies are around, that we only have two of you left. 
I know, isn't that awful? Isn't that sad? And actually, Alan died younger than he should. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and Natalie was quite, you know, she was in her 90s, which I didn't know. Jim was the first one. Mr. Howell was the first one to go. And he got ill very quickly. Um, I was surprised with Bob. I mean, Bobby. And I was surprised with the professor both. Professor was older. Uh, and, and, he, and he had lung cancer, so it took him, you know, a year or two. But, but uh, and he was, I didn't know, he was almost 90, I had no idea. Fought in World War II. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it's very sad. It really is very sad because we were a family. And that red, you saw that as in the cast. We all got along. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. Well, uh, as we're doing this interview, Don, I'm actually getting some questions that are being sent in from our listeners. So in between Terry's questions, I'll kind of field them to you. Um, and the first question sure. is, uh, I have a question for Don. Can you ask her what she thought of the reunion movies they did and how they treated Mary Ann in them? Well, I think they treated Mary Ann very much the same. I thought the, the reunion movies were, like, silly. I think mm-hmm. Mike and Mike Gilligan down in his pretty silly. Coming on and, not, and getting off is also ridiculous. But it was the first time ever that they, anybody had done anything like that. Our first, oh, I don't know if it was Rescue or Surviving, I don't remember which the first one was. It was Surviving is the one I produced. But it, it was um, a phenomenon. It was the first time anybody had done anything as a recap of a, of a series. And we got the highest rating, and I think the only show that beat us, and I don't know which one it was, it was either the Muhammad Ali fight or the World Series. Mm. was the only show that beat that that then it became very redundant and I think 90 minutes is too long well you've definitely been a supporter of Gilligan's Island to uh, so much to the point that you've done all those reunion movies uh, I don't know like how concerned you are a lot of people don't realize you did stuff before Gilligan's Island and stuff after uh, I had somebody just write me and wants to know about the town that dreaded sundown Oh my goodness, and what's a great experience because they've, they've made, they've done a remake. I have not seen it. But, uh, I had done a movie called Winterhawk, which is an absolutely beautiful western with Michael Dante, and returned to Boggy Creek by the same director. And he called me one day and he said, Don, I've got an actress that can carry groceries and talk at the same time. If I send my plane for you, will you come and do a couple of days' work? It was a true story in the town where he lived. A murder. I said, sure, Charlie, I'll do it. So I, I came and did it, and it was a, took place in the 40s and it was really quite an experience because I was the character, the only character that lived through the movie and it was, they'd never caught the killer and uh, it's a couple of funny stories but at one point about 3 o'clock in the morning I've, you know, I've been shot in the face and I've got blood all over myself and I'm supposed to be crawling through a cornfield and Charlie the director says, now be careful Don because I get charged a dollar fifty corn stock so try not to break any. Now it's, you know, one o'clock in the morning and you're crawling So how do you know what you're supposed to be doing? You're acting. Anyway, the reason she survived was she was crawling away from the killer and a dog barked and uh, that was chained and a dog barked and woke up the family in the farmhouse which saved her instead of the killer getting her. So we're now at three o'clock in the morning about to shoot that scene. And we are in Texarkana, Arkansas, where it's all good old boys. It's not union people mm-hmm. <clears throat> with their pets and all of that. And they have a pit bull with a stake between me and the house. It's about three, and they and I'm about, I don't know, 50 feet from the dog. And the director says, now, it was one of the crew or somebody's dog. Now, is he vicious? Oh, he's very vicious. Well, if he gets away, we're going to we're gonna shoot him. That's okay. If he goes after her, that's everybody said, that's fine. So... I'm crawling towards the dog, and I and I see I'm about 15 feet away from him, and I see the snake start to come out of the ground, mm-hmm. and you know how dog's lips curl? Mm-hmm. It's a pit bull, and I put my face in the grass and my hand over my head, hand o- hits, hands over my head so the dog would get my back and not my face, and all of a sudden, all the guns started to go. <laughs> Everybody's trying to shoot the dog. Nobody got the dog. Nobody killed each other. But it was absolutely the most frightening experience. Wow. And then by the time we finished the scene, I went back to the motel. <clears throat> and when I walked into the lobby, the guy behind the desk, I had, you know, blood dripping down my face, my hair all matted, fainted because he thought it was true. <laughs> so it really was quite an experience. It was the town that Don dreaded at sundown, I guess. I don't know. It was very funny. They made it again because they've never caught him. <clears throat> wow. So That's they don't problem. really know. I don't know what's happening now. Wow. I've got a really good question for you. And in, in knowing that, that Mary Ann's kind of giving advice in this book, what would Mary Ann do? If Mary Ann was giving advice to the castaways and it was left up to two people, 
to repopulate the island, would it <laughs> would it be would it be Marianne and Gilligan or Marianne and Professor? Because she was kind of well, going both well, ways on it. Just ask your co-host there. Just ask her that question. <laughs> there is no decision. Of course, it would be the professor. <laughs> Not the fact that either one of them could build a boat, but he was a hunk. <laughs> and when he got off the island, he'd get a better job. <laughs> so. That's right. There you go. <laughs> uh, good question, though. Real good question. Um, so, I, Don, I got another question from the audience, um, and they said, can you please ask Don to tell us if it's true that there was a Gilligan's Island, the musical? Yes, there was. <laughs> or it. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty. It's pretty hard to do uh, somebody coming from outer space or a volcano or anything like that on stage. Yeah, there is, and I, it was kind of shopped around. And Barry Williams and I played Thurston and Lovey. Barry Williams and I did Thurston and Lovey in a small theater in in uh, Florida, trying it out for the writers. But I don't think it has any legs to tell you the truth. <laughs> You know, talk about singing and, and musicals. It really is true. It's an interesting tidbit that if you watch the beginning of, of Gilligan Island when it first started, uh, Marianne and Professor really wasn't mentioned. You guys were called and the rest. And then later on, they changed the song to include your names. Well, and what it was, we th- those three characters were rewritten. When the pilot was made, there were three school teachers. School teachers and CBS said, let's you know rewrite, get some more characters. So they developed a movie star, a farm girl, and a professor. And everybody auditioned, and Ginger auditioned in New York. And she got her role before we were cast in L.A. And her agent said she's in fifth position billing, and nobody after her. So the contract stated that, those five people, and after that, we had to be at the end of the credits. And then at the end of the first year, and I really don't know who was responsible. Gilligan says he was, Sherwood says he was, I don't know what the, what the reason was, but they changed the billing. So then it became all seven of us. Wow. You know, a lot of people describe Sherwood as, as a, a tough cookie, but a lot of people said he was a dear, dear man. What did you think of Sherwood Swartz? Well, um, he was a very nice man. He was very fair and very polite and very nice with everybody. Uh, he has a great family. Um, he, he, was, he, was, he was very honest. I think now that so much time has gone by and I realize... We got no rerun money at all, no residuals. I mean, Matt, I'm sorry, maybe the first nine months we made $12,000 or something, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But uh, I did a thing for CBS called um, TV Moguls. I, I moderated something you know, quite a while ago. And I did not know till then that Sherwood Schwartz, quote from them, made $90 million on the reruns alone. Wow. Not the production, not the reruns of the Brady Bunch. And I thought, with $90 million, and there's seven of us, and we didn't get a dime, I sort of think that's a little stingy. Give a million dollars between us, or something. So they kind of gave me, they kind of gave me an upstart, saying, well, I mean, he was a wonderful family man, and a very good comedy writer, et cetera. I can't put it down, it was the things that was the time at that time. Right. But I would think that would have been a little generous, you know? I don't know, maybe never thought of it. Well, according to, to my information here, I don't know if it's correct, and you don't even have to answer if you don't want to, uh, I guess it's said in 64... You received a salary of one thousand six hundred dollars a week, and then when you did the reunion movie in seventy eight, you got sixty thousand dollars. Is that right? Or oh, I have no idea. I, I, I think I think my first salary the first year was seven fifty a week, seven hundred fifty dollars okay. a week. I have no idea what I got on the on the special that many years later. I really don't know. To tell you the truth, that's a good question. I should look it up. <laughs> I produced Surviving Gilligan's Island as a producer. I got some money. Uh, you know, through the networks and stuff, mm-hmm. but not in a rerun. So I really don't know. You know, when you think they're making a million dollars a week now for the Big Bang Theory and stuff, it's just amazing, isn't it? Yes, it, is. it is. I want I want to commend you so much because I'm somebody that's having a lot of problems and uh, and quickly becoming somebody with limited mobility. And I understand you do a lot for that. You have a foundation, and if you could talk about your Wishing Wells uh, Foundation. Well, I, d- I designed a line of clothing. I had a friend in a nursing home for. I knew her for 11 years and there were not, couldn't put anything on that you couldn't put on backwards mm-hmm. very hard who somebody can't move their bodies at all to look decent at anything so I thought for gosh sakes what do we do in, the, in on stage there's Velcro everywhere 
So I designed a lot of my mother's had a small stroke, and she learned to dress herself finely. But I, 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 I got, what did I know about the garment industry? That's number one. I was stupid to even think I did know anything. And I finally sold the idea to Penny's, and Penny's ripped me off. Mm. But I, 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 I give you uh, uh, applause for what you have to face. And any limited mobility is very difficult. And I'm just speaking from very, very minor, but my knees have dislocated from the time I was sixth grade. Yeah. So I can't play any sports. And now I'm having a hard time with stairs. Right. I, I, I look at people who run down the stairs, I thought, I can't do that. So we all have something that we have to face. But I, 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 I wish you well because it's not an easy chore, I know. Well, I, th- I thank you. It's hard because, like, limited is like you can walk but it's not right and you have trouble and i don't know which is worse you know i mean well because people don't understand yeah Yeah, people don't understand uh don another question from the audience uh uh did don wells do the voice of both marianne and ginger in the cartoon of gilligan's planet that's a good question yes i did i did and it was kind of fun because they hadn't cast ginger wouldn't do it and i thought well i can do that so the first go around i would do you know your taping so I would do all the Marianne characters, and then the second time we do it, I do all the Ginger characters. And finally, I said, I can talk to myself. Marianne can talk to Ginger. <laughs> so that was the most fun, you know, going back and forth with both voices. I love voiceover stuff. I really would like to do some more. I really do like it. We're uh, good friends with Jerry Rochelle, and uh, she did the Brady Bunch uh, Variety Hour because Eve Plum wouldn't do the show. Uh, I guess she didn't want to sing or right. whatever. It, is it kind of weird, like when you did some of the reunion movies, Tina Louise didn't do them. Is it kind of weird when somebody walks into that role that you can hear you work with Tina forever? Well, it is because I think it throws the chemistry off. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, not, that, not that Judy Ball and, and, and Connie Corsland didn't do a good job, but, but, the, but the chemistry is different. You know, that's in anything. In a play, if you change a leading man to somebody else, the chemistry is different. And, and I think Tina was perfect as Ginger. Just perfect. So that's also hard too. But I had a hard time when I when I produced Surviving Delegate Fallon. I was trying to show who we were before the show and then doing the show and who we were afterwards. And I really have a, a lot of respect for producers because I auditioned just about everybody to play those other characters, and nobody came really through the way the characters were. You know, you can't duplicate someone. It's pretty tough unless you're an impressionist. Mm-hmm. Especially Mrs. Howell, which was funny because we had some wonderful people. Gretchen Weiler and, and Betsy Palmer came in and they all did it British. And I mm. said she wasn't British. It was sort of a theater speech. And Gillian is very tough to cast. It all was. I mean, the chemistry between us was perfect. Right. And uh, another question, Don, uh, from the listeners. They said, uh, Don mentioned Return to Boggy Creek earlier. Can you ask her what it was like working on that set, especially working with someone like Dana Plato? I'll have some funny stories about it. We really were in the swamps of Louisiana. We really were where if you fell off the boat, the water moccasins would get you. <laughs> and Dana's mother, oh yeah, it was very spooky. And Dana's mother was very much a stage mother, pushing her into things, you know. Mm-hmm. And I remember... <laughs> We had a little premiere in the little tiny town, and uh, they were interviewing Dana and myself uh, on television, and it was a small television station, and they had to step out into the outside for the lighting, and we were in a brico block wall in the shape of an L, which was about six feet deep, and and I, the, the, uh, radio, the announcer was next to Dana, and, and I was next to Dana on the other side. She was in the middle. And he was doing a station break or something, and she said to me, I think I'm going to throw up. I think I'm going to throw up. So when he came back, I kind of went, I think she's going to be sick, and he just went right on. Just kept, and she turned around and threw up <laughs> on camera. <laughs> I don't remember anything else about anything, except the poor little girl couldn't help it, and the, and the poor announcer didn't hear what I said or didn't care. It was very funny. It, it was very funny. It's, it's, it's really but, the... It was hard working in the swamps. It really yeah. was because there were really water moccasins around, so it was pretty real. It's really the two sides of Hollywood, isn't it? I mean, you turned out so well and are happy, and poor Dana, which she went through and then wound up leaving us, you know. Well, and I also think it's mother pushing her. Maybe it wasn't even her idea. Yeah. Right. I happened to love what I was doing and chose to do what I was doing, and I was very lucky doing it. So what would there be to complain about? If you don't like it, go do something else. Right. I love seeing you on a uh, episode of the uh, Sci-Fi Channel. I forget the name of the show. It was a Hollywood collectible show, and you were talking about selling your Marianne costume. Now you have since done that, right? No, nope, didn't sell it. 
Oh, good for you. <laughs> I still have it, so it's in my drawer. <laughs> and don't you dare come and steal those. It's <laughs> kind of iconic since it was the first short ever on television, you know? Yeah. Yes. I, but I don't have any kids, so it's kind of interesting to see where they'll go. Well, I doubt if you're ever going to be eating peanut butter. So <laughs> as long as you can't hang on to it, because, man, that is something that, that's got to mean so much to you. I think, I think... Well, and I designed them. I designed them because you couldn't show your navel, and I was little, and I wanted to make my torso look longer and my legs look longer, and so I had quite a bit of input there. Wow, I didn't wow, know that. Wow. So uh, as we kind of wrap this up, Dawn, I did have uh, one other question that came in, um, and this one says, can you ask Dawn about the recent surprise she gave to Sandra Bullock? Aha! That was so much fun. I had a gentleman by the name of Gina Salamone, and he used to send Bob and I out on personal appearances and stuff. And, and he interviews a lot of the stars. I don't know what it's called, pre-publicity. I did it for uh, Australia for quite a while And when the movie's coming out. Mm-hmm. So he called me and said, Don, I got a favor. I said, what? He said, well, for the last 10 years, I've been proposing to Sandra Bullock every time I interview her in a movie. He said, I've changed my tactic now. I want to do something else. I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, will you just come and surprise her? I said, sure, Gino. So he went out and got a coconut cream pie. And he said, now I'm going to ask her. I don't want to marry her. I want her to be my mistress. And I said, oh, that will be fun. <laughs> so he came in and he said, I don't, want, I don't want to marry you anymore. I want to just live with you on the island and I have my own cook. <laughs> and he brought me in with a coconut cream pie. It was so much fun, and she got such a kick out of it. It was really great. <laughs> wow. Well, for everybody out there that needs to know, uh, unless this is a typo on IMDb, I guess you have a film role coming up uh, in something called This Is Our Time. No, and I don't even know what that is. Okay. Well, but I would like to talk a little bit more about the book, because I, I would Absolutely. like to say that you can get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble or my website, uh, which I would personalize if you asked for it. I am very proud of it because I think it really is a result of, of the 50 years that we've been on the air and what the show has meant. It isn't behind the scenes stuff as much as what was that message? Mm-hmm. And obviously it means something to three generations. So I, I, it's a great Christmas gift. It's great to sit down with your 13 or 14 year old kids, you and your mom. I mean, it's not a goody two shoes kind of book at all. It's just what's your responsibility? Right. Where are you now? And it's a very confused world. And I appreciate what you all are doing because the radio really has a, a real um, uh, a way of, of saying things and teaching things, and, and it's, it's very important. So I'm just I'm thrilled to death that you've given me this time. Well, absolutely. And I wanted to mention also you have a book tour going on. From uh, what I understand, you have appearances coming up uh, December 9th at Romans and November 22nd at the Santa Monica Library and also the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce Authors Program on December 6th in L.A., right? Yeah, I've got everything. I'm in Phoenix for, for a charity, uh, in, uh, Faith, Charity Never Faileth. I'm in, I'm in, uh, Seattle. I, I travel a, a great deal and, you know, in the next two or three months a lot. So if any of your listeners are close by, come and, come and pick up a book and talk to me. It's fun. I'd love to see your reaction and I'd like to see if I raised you well. Right. <laughs> I'm sure you did. And to turn around and have you be so nice as a sign the books, I mean, what a better deal to, to get something advice and also a signature from That's a TV right. legend. I mean, man, is your is your cookbook still available, Dawn? My cookbook, uh, the old cookbook, I don't know if it's still out or not, but I'm right in the middle of one that's coming out in the spring. Oh, ah. awesome. So I'm, wow. in, I'm in the middle of a new one. It's, you know, it's that good old family cooking, and what I've done is involve my Facebook fans. And it's really fun. You know, from all over, and what where they get their recipes and why. So it's fun. I haven't titled it yet, but look for it in the spring. It's coming out. As a matter of fact, I'm in Virginia right now writing. Perfect. That's what I'm doing. Perfect. Well, in the meantime, listeners, uh, we encourage you. You can check out the book. What would Mary Ann do? A guide to life. You can get it on Amazon as well as uh, Dawn's website, which is dawn wellscom And uh, make sure to go over there and check out all of her appearances that are coming up, and and head on out and let her know that. You heard her on our radio show. Dawn, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the air tonight. It's been so much fun. Thank you, and great questions. Have a good life, both of you. Thanks a million. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.